Acts 13, it said they were ministering to the Lord, praying and fasting. They were ministering to Him. Like, fasting is not fun. So you better not be ministering to you when you're fasting. Are you with me? They, minist they were ministering to the Lord, and then they laid hands on Him and sent people out. So incredible. And that's when they ran into that sorcerer. And Paul, Paul had a name change in there, Saul to Paul, in that same chapter. And he said, you son of the devil, full of deceit, you shall be blind. Whoa. Can you imagine today? hanging out on your journey that the Lord sent you on and you're at Walmart and someone practicing magic is there trying to like sway people and they get like in someone's ear to tell them this guy's a and all of a sudden from your voice you son of the devil and they're blind, you might get in trouble for that one. I went in my closet this afternoon, after this morning, it was so good. It just has been one continuous day. Sundays are pretty intense for, for us. We get up, I get up early to be with Jesus. I come here to be with Jesus. I go home to be with Jesus, and I come back to be with Jesus again. It's full on. It's like a big, huge Happy Meal. It's amazing. It is. But I went back today, and my, my son wouldn't go to sleep, and mom, mom left and took the girl somewhere, so I had the boys, and I'm putting them down for a nap, and them going for a nap is daddy's time to be with Jesus, because I'm going to put them in the nap, lay there and cuddle with my little one for a little bit, and escape to my closet. That's what I do. That's how we roll. And so my little one wouldn't go to sleep, and I actually started whining. I said, Lord, I need to be with you. Put him to sleep. I even texted my wife. I said, I need you to come home right now because I got to be with Jesus or I'm not going to have anything to give anybody today. I really did. She didn't respond. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I have become so dependent that I can't function. <laughs> that scares people because we are so used to being dependent independent, dependent on ourselves. We, we are, I'm not kidding. People in ministry are used to being dependent upon themselves because you've got you to be strong. That's not how Paul ran. That's not how Jesus ran. See what I learned? <laughs> is the weaker I am, the stronger he is. We've confused it and, and, and brought sickness into that weakness part, but gosh, we shouldn't get it confused. We have to be very careful. All sickness comes from hell, period. So if sickness is there, you need to be healed, and we need to contend, period. Sometimes people take Paul's thorn and they bring it in and they say, well, Paul, Paul was sick, but he's not talking about sickness. He's talking about, he's talking about weakness and he's talking about being buffeted. There's so many things to talk about when, it, when we go on this journey of healing and wholeness and why, because what has, what has to happen is that every excuse 
that stands in front of why you need to be healed needs to be taken out of the way in order for you to pray with faith. There are so many things that try to jump in the way of faith. So many reasons, like typical reasons are, well, Jesus didn't heal anybody, everybody. Like he went to the five porches, he didn't heal everybody. I mean, he only healed one and he got out. Well, we're not headed to the cross so we can heal everybody. Jesus had three and a half years to accomplish everything that he was. He was, he was on his way to the cross. We can heal everybody at every porch because we can pray because we got the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And we need to utilize what we've been given. And we need to not be afraid of being persecuted because I promise you right now that when you live and believe God for the supernatural, you haven't even seen anything yet. <clears throat> when you say that you're right with God, it brings persecution. It's real. Religion hates the fact that I can be right with Jesus. Religion believes that I have to work for that and then maybe, but that's not how it did. Jesus worked for that so that I could become that so that all my works could be the byproduct of being right with God. <clears throat> it's the gospel. But when you start to pray for the sick and you start to believe God that he wants to heal the sick, first of all, you have to be able to look like a fool. Because somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody prayed for somebody and it didn't happen, so they had to save face and blamed it on them. Well, you need more faith, and you get more faith and come back, sister, and we'll pray. Tell me one person Jesus told that to. Come on, I'm just gonna be real. This will cause you to be so uncomfortable, it's absolutely ridiculous. See, we all want people to be healed, but we don't all want what comes with it. We all want people to be healed. <clears throat> and people, people that don't even believe in healing, if someone's sick, they really want them to be healed. Religion hates you saying you can and will be. Religion hates that. We have developed a mentality in the body of Christ that when you tell somebody that, we also tell them, don't get your hopes up. When the Bible says get your hope way up, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So what we've done is we've negotiated faith for feelings so we don't want to let anybody down. And to top that off, we don't want to be the one that prays and it doesn't happen because we look like a fool. You can't heal anybody, anybody. Anyway, God has to heal them through you, but he wants to use you as a yielded vessel. <clears throat> Are you guys with me? Like this is the uncomfortable gospel. Jesus didn't say you're going to be comfortable. He said you're going to need a comforter. He didn't say just go to church and hang out and have a great service and go home and then look forward to next Sunday. He said to be fully possessed with heaven itself so that you can be the doorway for God to flow through, to crush hell through you every day. He wants us to be people that destroy the works of the devil for a living. He doesn't want just the pastor or the preacher or the apostle or the teacher or the evangelist he doesn't want just them to do it. No, the fivefold gift is to equip the saints for the first thing we need to understand is we are saints in the eyes of the Father. And when you say you're a saint, you're gonna bring it on right there, buddy. I mean, I don't walk around with a card, St. Todd. <laughs> but if I don't see what I've become, I will minister out of the wrong place. Well, okay. <clears throat> Jesus said in the great, do you guys remember the great commission? Matthew 28, great commission. Go and preach the gospel, right? He who's baptized and believes will be saved, make disciples of all nations. He also said, teach them all the same things that I've commanded you. Do you hear that? He commanded the disciples to do things. Healing isn't an option, it's a command. Matthew 10, here, let me just read it real quick. <clears throat> when I say that we're really gonna go after this, I, I'm, we're really gonna go after this. Like 2021 is gonna be a wipeout for the devil, I promise you. A 
wipe out. You guys weren't here this morning when I shared my heart, but God spoke to me this morning before I came to church. And I said, Lord, I just love you. Because I've been, I was sick for about two weeks and just fatigued and run down and beat up and just felt really yucky. So I, I wasn't here uh, last, last Sunday. Theo did both services. And then I came on Christmas Eve because it was the first day. It was like 10 days in. I felt better. So I, I shared my heart, but I was still spinny. So this morning I said to the Lord, I said, I really, God, I, I, I feel so bad because I, every time I went to pray, I fall asleep. It was so crazy. And right after I'm like reading about the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is like, watch and pray. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Jesus is like, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation, guys. Come on. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Right? The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. I actually taught on it a couple Sundays ago. Do you guys remember? Was it you? Was it the morning? I don't know, but I did. It's right here. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Jesus was telling disciples that had no possibility of living in the strength of the spirit because they weren't born again. Are you guys with me? You can't have strength of spirit unless you're born again. So Jesus was telling unregenerated disciples because they couldn't be born again until Jesus went to the cross. You guys understand that? Let's not, let's get it right. These disciples were orphans with power that went around blowing stuff up and falling asleep. Are you with me? They wanted to blow up cities. Why? Because they didn't know what spirit they were of. Jesus says, go ahead to the city. Go and tell them I'm coming. All right. Lord, they don't want you there. Can we call down fire and kill them like Elijah? Jesus said, come on, guys. You don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come into the world to kill it, but to save it. Right? So these disciples in the garden are, are doing what Jesus said, falling asleep. Because their spirit wasn't able to be willing because their flesh was completely weak, and Christians have carried that over into the born-again Christian experience and saying, my spirit is willing, my flesh is weak and live by the weakness of flesh. I was sick, and it was lights out. So I'm trying to go in there, and who knows that God knows when you need rest. So I'm trying to read. <laughs> Two and a half hours later, I wake up. What is happening right now? This is crazy. I can't stand it. Lord. I love you with all my heart. I fall asleep again. Like, what was happening? I, I just needed sleep. This morning, I was able to, yesterday I was able to spend three hours with the Lord. I was so excited. I'm like, I said to Jack, I said, honey, I need this right now, please. She goes, okay. So I sat there for three hours and loved Jesus and ministered unto the Lord. Because when I'm in there, I'm ministering unto him. I'm loving him with everything in me. And it's totally different. It's not me getting ministered to by the Lord. It's me ministering to the Lord. Me loving him. And God, this belongs to you. And Lord, I love you. And you are so good. And you are wonderful. So this morning, I went in for the same thing. I'm like, Lord, I love you so much. Thank you so much. God, I love you. I'm so excited this morning. He said, that's great. You've quenched me. That's not very nice. Not to hear the Lord say, you've quenched me. Could you handle that? Because there's a couple of things we can do, Holy Spirit. I talked about this morning. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit. You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That one right there, no. Grieve, quench. Grieve, he talks about it in Ephesians. He talks about let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but that which is used for edification and encouragement that would provide grace to those that hear you. And then it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit right after that, right where your words are, because we can grieve him with the way that we're thinking, the way that we're speaking, with bitterness, with anger, with wrath, with rage, with malice, all that stuff. We grieve him another way. Let me just read it real quick, and then hopefully I'll make sense out of all these different rabbit trails I've been on. <clears throat> 
Quenching is what you do to this is what you do to the spirit of the living God while grieving is how he responds to your actions. It says about quenching in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. I'm just going to read it. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Do not quench the spirit. When I think of quench, I said it this morning, I think of quench of I'm really, really thirsty and need something to drink. And when I take that drink, it quenches my thirst. But I think of quench in another way. There is a flame that's burning and I, I stop it from burning. So when God spoke to me and said, you've quenched me, I immediately, God, I repent, I'm so sorry. I've traveled all over the world and these last nine months, 10 months, hasn't been very much traveling at all. But I have seen in my last 16 years of being a Christian, the most whacked stuff coming from the pulpit. And somewhere along the way, it caused me to put the brakes on when it comes to the miraculous. Traveling all over the world, I've watched so many people just get it. I mean, they get it. I can teach you how to pray for the sick in, 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 in a minute. And the sick can be healed. But you're responsible to make sure that you weed your own garden. The danger is when the miraculous comes into a person's life, attention comes on a person's life. And this stage is a very dangerous place, more dangerous than anybody knows. Because to he who is given much, much is required. But that much is required is when you stand before him. Okay, gosh. I talked about the prophetic and some things that I've seen. There was a well-known prophet who would, it was crazy ridiculous accuracy. Like, oh my gosh, like really? Oh, wow. They set him up. And they made a fake Facebook account. And when he got up to get the mic, he prophesied exactly what was on the fake Facebook account over that person that they set him up with. And he was exposed. And in that prophetic realm, sometimes the pressure is so strong that you have to produce another prophetic word in order to live up under the place that you've made for yourself. <laughs> Scary. Somewhere along the line, the reverence for the Lord started to wane and the receiving honor from people started to gain. And so all of a sudden, the needing to receive praise from people far outweighed the reality of the fear of the Lord. And we've built big ministries on that stuff. And, and man, they have fallen so hard. And all of a sudden, you have a move of God that is so powerful. And so many people are like, whoa. And all of a sudden, you find out there's adultery behind this scene because someone's heart was intended to. Because nobody, they didn't minister to the Lord. And now people that are in that ministry that were around that person didn't say anything because they needed stature. And they call it protection, but really it's the devil coming into a camp, ruining God. I said this morning, I said, when you're driving down the road and, and a deer jumps out in front of you, the first thing you need to do, if you can't hit the brakes, is get around that deer. Or else that deer is gonna become deer baloney, deer burger, but it's gonna mash your car and damage everything. So what happened is somewhere along the way, I swerved to miss the deer, I went off the road. Not in sin, just backing off of the miraculous. And I went after righteousness with everything in me, and I'm still going after it, because we can't afford to move in power without purity. The Lord spoke to me, and he said, you've laid quite the foundation of righteousness. It's okay to jump into power. I said, oh God, thank you. You have no idea. This is what brings persecution. This is what, this is what amplifies it. And I looked at my life and I looked at like, 
the protesters and I looked at the people coming against me and it's not enough right now. It's not, I've fallen short on the persecution level. I need that to increase. But I need the people that aren't afraid to actually live in this too. Otherwise the persecution will push you away and you'll go somewhere else where it's comfortable. And you'll tuck into some really big place where you can just get in and out. Nobody knows you. Gosh. I would rather die. I'm not kidding. I'm so undone right now. Probably because of my book, too. In that book, there's such conviction and such ridiculous Oh my gosh, what are you going to do with the life that God gave you? And I started to read my own book and it made me go, oh my gosh, this guy's convicting. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not boasting in me. I'm telling you that it's convicting. It's challenge. It will challenge your life. I want to be challenged, man. And if it needs to be by my book, then that's awesome. But I need to be challenged. Like, I remember just getting saved and praying for people and everybody hating me. I mean, despising me. My own wife wouldn't even go in public with me for nine months, dude. It was just me and the Lord. And I'd go home and I'd, I'd come home from work. I'd share a couple testimonies from work. She would say, get away from me. I don't want to hear it. I would go make dinner for everybody, go back in my room and tuck away and be with Jesus. And I'd live inside of my room and he would just love me. And I'd come out and get yelled at. I'm not kidding. And then I'd go to one of the things, I had a phone call from a friend of mine who went home to visit family and their family was not the happiest people that they left. COVID has done stupid, crazy things to people's minds. It has caused great God-fearing Christians to turn from fearing God to fearing a disease. It has caused them to get upset and has put stumbling blocks in front of them. And they will look at a building like this and say, you guys don't care about anybody but yourself, not realizing that we are supposed to gather together and not forsake the assembling together of the saints. But we're not just coming here to huddle inside of a four-walled building and just, just like keep this to ourselves. We are supposed to be people that are outrageously in love, courageous in faith, bold in proclamation, not wearing a basket on our head, but are being very vocal about our faith. We're supposed to be soldiers in an army that are not supposed to lay aside the actual, the plans from our captain. The plans for the captain in Matthew 10 were go and preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead and cast out devils. Freely you've received, now freely give. And then in Luke 10, verse nine, Jesus said, go and heal the sick and then tell them the kingdom. So either way, it's show and tell or tell and show. It was never supposed to be just talk about it. When I got saved, I made a shirt a, a couple years in and it said 420 on it. Because a lot of you don't know what that means. But 420 in the world means time to get high. Because at four o'clock you're getting off of work, 20 after you're stoned. 420, April 20th, is actually a drug holiday across the world. It is. I used to celebrate it, but I used to celebrate it every day. And so I had a t-shirt made that said 420 on the front of it. And in little letters above it, it said 1 Corinthians. And on the back, it had the scripture, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Because that's the original 420. And I put there's no high like the most high. Because, see... Once you have God, once you get hooked on God and his presence becomes, this is the air I breathe. 
This is the air I breathe. Your holy word, not read to me, spoken to me. without him? Can you live without his presence? Because we've learned to. We've learned to feed on the world instead of his word, and we've learned to feed on opposite of God. You will not function that way. You will be like a fish out of water. A fish can't breathe in our air. A fish has to have water and the natural substance for us to actually live our lives has to be the very word of God, the living bread of heaven. Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. There is no discipleship without eating him and drinking him. There is no way for you to function in this world that you were not created to be of the world. You were created to be of the kingdom. When you get born again, it's essential to unlock your potential, but it's the beginning. He becomes my savior when I get saved. He becomes my Lord when I listen to him and obey his commands and go after him with everything that he is. The air you breathe, the songs that we sing, when we're singing those songs and we're doing what Jesus said must be done, Those that worship me, he says, must worship in spirit and in truth. Somehow, somewhere along the way, we have said that the Christian life is an actual career and that we need to have a pulpit in order to be okay. This isn't about being famous. This is about bringing Jesus into the limelight so that he can receive the reward of his suffering. And somehow along the line, that doesn't mean that if you don't have, you have gifts and you have talents, and there's a call. I get it. There's a call, but all of us are called. Those he's called, he's justified. Those he's justified, he's glorified. If you don't see that you've been justified, you will need this in order to function well. When the only way that you function well is right here when no one's looking. This is where everything makes sense. Everything. Therefore, when the demonstration of the kingdom comes, your identity doesn't come because someone got healed. Anybody can heal the sick. Come on. We are supposed to be imitators of God. Imitators, not imposters. (laughs) How deep is your Jesus? How strong is your relationship with him? Can you function a day without him? Can you function an hour without him? Most people can. In the early church, let me ask you this. In the book of Acts, in in Acts number two, the Holy Spirit is poured out. I read through the book of Acts. I I was cruising through going, oh my gosh. This is so today. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out. Bang. Boom. Literally, boom. On that day, they're in there praying in the upper room. Jesus is crucified. Jesus is resurrected. These disciples are told by Jesus, go to there there and pray. Go and tarry. Go in Jerusalem and wait. Go and wait for the promise. Go and wait for the promise. Go and wait for the promise. And they go, and the promise comes. Bang. It says that the heavens were ripped open and the Holy Spirit was poured out on these disciples and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire happened. Boom! 
and everybody in Jerusalem, everybody, were like, what is happening? And they all were drawn to the place where the wind blew. What is happening here? And one of the guys says, these guys are drunk with wine because they looked out of their minds. These disciples, and Peter, the one that denied Jesus. See, you're gonna do one of two things in this house. You're gonna be forced to either deny yourself or to deny Jesus. You will not be able to just come here and function normal. We are not supposed to be a normal people. We are supposed to be a peculiar people, set apart that people would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Because they would say, there ain't no way that that man did those works, those are the works of God. I need to be like the disciples when they, no when they noticed that these men were untrained and uneducated men. If you're trained and educated, you just need to do greater works. Are you with me? You have to be able to do works that you could possibly not just do in your own strength. Your weakness is a magnet for his strength, but we've been taught that you have to be strong, brother. You have to look out for number one. No, you don't. You look out for him and then he looks out for you. He's our strong tower. He's the one that we're supposed to run in. He's the one that we're supposed to hide in. He is the one that fights our battles. He is the one that goes out and brings back the head of an enemy and says, look what you did. He is our great defender. Come on, dude. You go out there and God makes you look absolutely wonderful. The dangerous thing is that you think it's you. That's why pride comes before the fall. Gosh, dangerous place to be. Receiving honor and receiving praise from people. Building up your repertoire. Building up your fan base. Look at all these people that like me. Dude, most of the people that are friends on Facebook really aren't my friends. I posted something about Santa Claus and half of them lost their mind. Tell your kids the truth. Santa's not real. I post that on there. People are like, let them believe. What the heck is wrong here? What are we thinking? Let them believe. They're little. Come on. Okay. Do you know that kids don't get a junior Holy Ghost, but you're going to give them a fake Santa Claus to get through life? Oh, gosh. Help me, Jesus. I want to see the dead raised. I want to see the blind see. I want to see the deaf hear. I can't do any of it. I want to see people get new organs. I want to see people go back to the hospital and say, you got a brand new kidney. We don't even know what's happening here. It's brand new. This is obviously something's wrong. Well, doc, you're the one that did the CAT scans before, so what do you think it is? I don't know, but this is absolutely a different kidney than this kidney. It's different. There's, it's completely different. Well, that's because the Lord. Now, it's time that we start bringing Jesus proper glory. Oh, gosh. Look, I'm going to go after this, regardless if anybody else wants to. It doesn't matter, because this is my church. The Lord gave us this building for purpose. I mean, we're paying for the building. But the Lord let us be here so that we could make him famous. So that we could put a school in here, LCU, Lifestyle Christian Unity University. So that we could raise up warriors. I want us to walk in purity. It, it, it's, it's so damaging when you find out that somebody's been in sin. But nothing surprises me. 
That's why it's so imperative that you and I live and grow in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. To where I actually fear God. Not afraid of God, petrified of God. In such an awestruck reverence of who he is as my father. That I am right with him. And when I find out that I'm right with him. I said it this morning. Jesus didn't just pay a price to forgive your sin. Jesus paid a price to remove your sin. That doesn't mean that you can't sin. People can sin. But your want to sin goes away with your love for him. The more you fall in love with him, the less you want to do things that are outside of him. And you find that your whole life is about codependency. It's where you're codependent upon Jesus. You're co-crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. And no longer living for yourself, but living to bring glory to the one who gave it all to you. And that doesn't go away as you grow in the Lord. You actually go lower and lower and lower. The growth track of Jesus is you go down further and further and further, and you go lower and lower and lower and lower. When Jesus is amplified more and more and more and more and more. To where when you stand before him one day, he looks at you and says, well done. I haven't want to be responsible for training people how to do it without showing them who they are. So my big dilemma, my big, the hardest part about what I do as an equipper is to not is to not equip you well enough to get you from the bottle of milk to the meat. The first job that I have is to get the pacifier out of your mouth. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. If you're not drinking from the pure milk of the word, you haven't grown. You can be a Christian for 50 years and not grow at all. And it's not okay. So I have to treat everyone as if they might be on a pacifier. That doesn't mean, I'm not calling you babies, but if the shoe fits, kick it off. That's right. To grow with the pure milk of the word, most people, most people go to church and don't open their Bible on a daily basis themselves to grow, therefore, in the Lord. They will watch a TV show. They will watch a YouTube video. They will read a book about the Bible. They will go and listen to different people's messages. But rarely do you see somebody that gets saved, goes into their closet, and seeks the Lord when no one's looking. So my dilemma as a preacher, as a teacher, as somebody that wants to equip people has to be from up here looking and gauging people where are they at and if I've got some people that are some people that I believe are drinking milk I'm so excited if I have people that I know are eating meat I'm super super excited but I know that I'm going to have people that have a pacifier and it's my job to pull that pacifier out of your mouth to make you hunger and thirst for the very thing that God says you'll be filled with And it all starts with you knowing that you're right with the Lord. The Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit's going to do three things, Jesus said. Three things. He's going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's what he said. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I'm going to go to be with the Father. And of judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. That's what he says. So the Holy Spirit comes. Watch this. Day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes. Peter had gotten his foot in his mouth a bunch. Peter had been called the devil by Jesus. Get behind me, Satan, because his mind was full of the things of man and not the things of God. Remember? Peter was also the one that denied Jesus. I'll never deny you tonight before the rooster crows. Dude. 
And I promise you that he didn't think he was gonna deny him, but Peter was full of his own strength. And in your own strength, you're an utter failure. (laughs) He denies Jesus. That had to be the roughest thing ever. Paul too, Saul, denied Jesus, not just denied Jesus, became a killer of Christians. Saul, first Christian martyr, Stephen. I was reading about it today. Saul is this young, proud Pharisee, tribe of Benjamin, thinks he knows it all, and when it comes to, when it comes to being a Pharisee, he does. The Pharisees were there in front of Jesus and didn't even recognize it was Jesus and thought that because they studied the scriptures, they thought in them they had eternal life, but they weren't even willing to come to him who all scriptures testified about to have it. So these Pharisees, these religious brood of vipers, John the Baptist called them, didn't know how to bear fruit worthy of repentance because they didn't even know what repentance looked like. And you've got Saul who's persecuting Christians, the first Christian martyr, Stephen. The clothes are laid at his feet. He consents to it. This is crazy. This guy is killing Christians. This, these religious zealots, they're, man, they're burning just to be in charge because pride does that to you. Makes you think you're smarter than everybody else. Makes you think that you know more than everybody else. You're not out for the welfare of anybody. You're out to make yourself look good at the cost of making other people look bad. It's called religion. It's pride. So this religious soul, Stephen is killed. And Saul's on a rampage. He's got a letter, man. He's going to go and put more Christians in prison. He is going to stomp out this sect. I love Jesus and his mercy. Saul's like, (laughs) off the horse or the donkey, whatever. He's on the ground, off of it, done. A light shines, a voice comes, Saul, Saul, who are you, Lord? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, why do you persecute me? I changed everything. The very one that was hard pressed to put an end to the sect, is knocked off his donkey, is blind, can't see anything. The soldiers heard the voice, they were petrified. They had no idea what it was. But Saul did. What would it have been like to see that? What would it have been like for Saul? I know we see the movies and stuff, but that had to be ridiculous. (laughs) Who are you, the one you're trying to put out? Then he becomes like this guy that gets possessed by the very thing he tried to put out. I don't know if you know Jehovah Sneaky. He's amazing. Peter, same thing. Peter denies Jesus. Now he's hanging with Jesus. He denies Jesus. Ridiculous. Denies him. So Jesus is like, you know what? I think I'm going to have him preach the first gospel message. I denied, he denied him three times. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter gets baptized with the Holy Ghost right there. Right? Mighty rushing wind. What happens? Peter preaches the gospel. And 3,000 people were added that day. 1,000 for each denial. Oh my gosh. What an amazing king. He's not interested in your education. He's not interested in your stature. 
He's not looking for the brightest of people. He's looking for people that are fully dependent and willing and available. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for you to have the huge resume. Your resume's great, but God's not the resume kind of God. No, no, no. Anything will do. You can be a, you can be a Satan worshiper heading a cult for, for 50 years, and God's like, yeah, that's good. Qualify. What needs to happen? You need to get out of the way. Yeah, but how can I do that? I remember telling my mom, she was so stressed out. I said, Mom, you just need to let Jesus have the wheel. And she was so, I'm not just gonna let go. It was awesome. Now listen, I'm that guy, the worst of the worst of the worst, that is stealing money from everybody, manipulating, maneuvering, hurting, destroying everybody. And then Jesus comes and knocks me off my donkey. Like for real, like knocks me off. And then he fills me and he's like, yeah, go get him. And my mom sees this happen. So my mom knows that this is absolutely impossible. Are you with me? Like she's the one that went through it. I put her through hell. I put her through hell. And she has seen the Lord go, like we didn't know, we didn't know relationship with Jesus. There was Episcopalian in the group. First there was, first there was Catholicism and then it was from Catholicism to Episcopalian, which is equally as religious, but really no knowledge of who God was as a father. And it wasn't like the only, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. There was no intimacy, there was no relationship, so that her son gets whacked by God, gets completely whacked by God. Now, my whole family, my mom, she's like, I hope this works. At first, <laughs> at first, I hope this works, but me going to see my family, they weren't happy about this. They thought this is like short-lived. Man, I went to my first my first Thanksgiving, I mean, I get saved, we get married in October, like I go to Teen Challenge, I leave in two months, I get completely wrecked by Jesus, like wiped out everything that I knew to be life, because I, I grew up and lived on the world, I fed on the world, I didn't, I didn't know how to feed on God, I fed on the world. And so I looked like what I fed on. And then all of a sudden I'm, how, mm. Got spiritual huggies on, totally excited because I just met my dad. I'm not kidding. But he did the same thing that he did for Peter. He convicted me of righteousness. He convicted me of sin. I got saved. Oh my gosh. I was totally full of sin. Jesus didn't pay a price to just forgive my sin, paid a price to remove my sin. I just dared to believe that he really did what the Bible says he did. I was so excited. I, man, I, I was like, what about my past? God's like, you don't have a past. Yeah, but all the people I've hurt, yo, well, they'll remember you for who you're not. So what do I do? Just read and believe. Okay. I'm forgiven much. I'm forgiven of everything. That's a much. I'm going to love as much as I've been forgiven. And since I've been forgiven of everything, I'm going to love with everything. Wow. People are like, oh, you were such a horrible sinner. Like you weren't. You just don't believe how much you've been forgiven because you can't love. The body of Christ has been angry at me about talking about that, talking about being forgiven of everything and that nothing remains. Well, like, no, that's not how it is. Read your Bible. Jesus wiped out the sin against me. He removed it as far as the east is from the west. My sins and my lawless deeds, he will remember no more. I'm not waiting for another covenant. I'm in this new covenant now. 
Why would I have to wait for that one day? It's not like I earn it. No, it's called grace. It's by his grace through faith that I've been saved. It's not because of something that I've done. It's because he did it for me. But if I don't step into what he did for me, then he can't do things through me. I just believed it. I'm like, yes. It's like amazing. I'm a psycho now. My, my whole family was like, oh my gosh, he's going to either be in jail or dead. And that's the track I was headed on, man. And I got shot at from 10 feet away, so I should be dead. And I am, but not the way that the world says I should have. No, 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 I died to the world. I was crucified to the world. I don't live for you. I live for him now. I don't live for you in the sake of whether you're okay with me and, and whether you're all right with what I say or how I share things and, and do you agree? Okay, great, then we can get along. No, I'm gonna preach the gospel which is like sandpaper, man. It's not the most happy message. No, it's the good news, but we boiled it down to, you gotta be a little more chill, dude. Don't be so excited. Yet, we can go to some baseball game and be super excited about our team winning, but we're not equally excited about Jesus saving us from our sin. What are we thinking? The whole world should know that you believe in Jesus, but instead we're 007 Christians. Don't want to offend anybody. I don't want my neighbor to be upset at me. I have to live beside them and see them every time I pull into my driveway. I don't want them to know that I'm a Jesus guy, so I'll just try to get to them. Maybe someone else will share. I'll just pray for them from my house. It's not acceptable. You're going to answer for your life. You're going to stand before God. You are here to leave a legacy. Come on. I am super convicted, buddy. And I went to Thanksgiving and I'm so excited to tell my family. I'm like, guys, I'm sorry. For what? For everything. What are you talking about? I tried telling my aunt, well, because Jesus, okay, okay, really? Wow, she let me have it with her smartness and drilled me and hammered me. I'm on the ground kneeling there crying and she's still going. I wasn't crying because she hurt me. I'm crying because I hurt her. I hurt everybody. And I'm gonna expect them to just see the same thing that I see when they're blind and can't see? I don't think so. I've gotta live this life out loud so that they can see real change because a tree is known by its fruit and I'm just getting rooted. So since I'm just getting rooted, how can I expect them to see fruit that's not there yet? I am a cherry tree. No, you don't know a cherry tree because it swings in the wind. You know a cherry tree because it bears fruit. <laughs> oh gosh. Gosh, he's taking me back. Oh. Get ready, hon. Oh, she's not in here, she already left. Everybody hammered me. My grandma says, I hope this works. I said, Grandma, I'm telling you, Jesus just, and my aunt interrupted. Don't listen to him. Oh, you're just gonna be one of those hypocrites. And honestly, there were so many, and she was so messed up by priests that were doing this to kids and all that. She had all the reasons why. Nobody, nobody was in love with Jesus. I sat there at the Thanksgiving table with a bunch of relatives that didn't believe what I believed. 
And all I could do was cry and talk about it and get hammered. And cry and talk about it and get hammered. And cry and talk about it and get hammered. And it happened again and again and again. And then we went to my wife's house, her mom's. Oh my gosh, they all just were so angry at me. It's not about Jesus, it's about family. No, he needs to be in our family. Oh my gosh, she married a lunatic. Oh, I'm totally not the person I was. I got a job, they're like, we'll see how long that lasts. Because I never held a job, I was really bad. I was excited to work because I realized my job was the place I get to represent the Lord. I didn't just get a job to go and earn money. I, I got a job unto Jesus and did it as unto the Lord and not for people. I, I was glad to bring a paycheck home. I was excited about that, but I, I was more excited about representing Jesus where I was at work and I was a pipe layer and everybody hated Jesus. Their construction, they're rowdy, they're wild ones, man. They don't want the gospel. So a lot of times Christians get saved and all of a sudden they're on their job. They don't mention anything, nothing changes. Maybe they say Jesus loves you and walk away because we, oh my gosh. Because we're more concerned about being comfortable on our job and not being made fun of than we are concerned about them going to hell. Oh gosh, I'm gone. People are going to heaven or going to hell. There is no in between. There's no waiting period. It is or it is not. And we have one shot at this thing. My question is, what are you gonna do with the life that God gave you? Are you gonna waste it? or you're gonna give it back to him. I wanna be known, I want this house to be known as a place where people burn with the gospel, that they can't wait to share it with somebody, that they have to tell somebody. I want this to be a place to where I can remove every bit of stumbling stones that stand in your way of mountains that are in your way, of valleys that you think you have to go through. Because Jesus said, John the Baptist said, let every valley be brought up and every mountain be brought low. Make a straight path for the Lord to travel. He didn't say that you're gonna get on the mountain and then down in the valley and then up on the mountain and down in the valley. Stop believing that Christianity is some kind of roller coaster ride, man. Get off the tracks and believe the gospel. The good news doesn't change tomorrow, doesn't change the next day, doesn't change the next day, unless Jesus brings us all home. The reality of this good news never gets old. Believing that you've been forgiven much so that you can love much. The byproduct of this is loving people. And Jesus said, don't just love those that can love you back. That's not love, even the Gentiles can do that. We want to love people that can't love us back. Why? Because blind people can't love you back. They don't know what it is. People are feeling set up like you're setting them up for something. Like what's the string? What's the catch? We go out to pray for somebody and they're waiting for what's the catch? There is no catch. Jesus paid for this. It's free. It's yours. It's, it's free. You're not like other people. Why, what do you mean? Well, I've been around Christian men. I've heard that so many times in my life. One of the worst comments that I've ever heard is, man, you're the real deal. It sounds like a good comment. It's horrible. It means that the majority of the body of Christ isn't the real deal. Which Jesus do you serve? Because my king is the real deal, man. He really died. He really raised from the dead. He really sits at the right hand. He really poured out the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit isn't for my enjoyment. 
He's in me for my sake, but he wants out of me for yours, and he's upon me for yours. He wants me to go to the grocery store and upset the place. He wants me to go to Walmart and people be healed when I leave. He wants to see converts be made, but not converts that do nothing, converts that actually walk with the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that bring God glory every step of the way, that when we walk, we squish Jesus. Whoosh. Yeah, but it's dry, not in here. Whoosh. Revival, where's revival? Right here, baby. Every one of us can walk with that. Every one of us walk, we are living epistles, known and read by all men the living word, having a binky in your mouth, having a pacifier in your mouth, going to a service, listening to a session, going from conference to conference to conference and doing nothing with what you've been given doesn't help you at all. Going after God, getting alone, going back to your closet, even tonight going back home and saying, God, I realize tonight that I hardly know you and I'm tired of living that way. Oh God, Holy Spirit's just waiting, buddy. I'm not kidding. If you would get alone with God and admit that you haven't been dependent, that you've depended upon the world to get through, you've depended upon people's likes, you've depended upon people's friends on Facebook, you've depended upon Instagram posts, you've depended upon that, creating some kind of false identity Now those things can be used for the glory of God, but just be careful it's not getting to your head thinking that you're more than you are. That's not mean. Oh, that's not mean, I promise you. You live by the praise of people, you die by the criticism of people. This message that I'm talking about right now doesn't go over well. Why, because it causes you to die to live causes you to completely die to what you thought you were in order for you to finally become who God says you are. A son, a daughter, right with God. Religion will hate you, will hate you. <laughs> Religion will hate you just like it put Jesus on a tree. But the relationship that was on that tree didn't get mad at the religion that put him there. I hope you heard that. The relationship that was hanging on a tree didn't get mad at the religion that put him there. And so for you to get upset at people that are religious, that are angry at you, because you think, one of the most common statements that I hear religious people say is you think you're holier than thou? You think you're something. It's the only thing it can say. You think that you're something. When Jesus, having equality with God, considered himself of no reputation, and humbled himself and became a bondservant because it wasn't about his reputation. He was dying for the very ones that were saying, crucify. And we think they're gonna treat us better? No way. I've went through this my whole life. 16 years, it's just lightened up, so I've, I've decided to increase it. Because I need it more. I need it more. I need more persecution. I need more people not understanding. But I need to suffer for doing good, not for doing bad. The disciples were faced with the same dilemma. You've got these disciples that walk by the gate of beautiful the gate called beautiful. This man was expecting to receive money from them, alms from them. And Peter looked and said, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have we give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they took him by the hand to stand to your feet and walk, and the lame man got up and walked. He was jumping, leaping, and praising God, and the people were freaking out. What? 
is happening. That's the guy that's been there for all these years. So they go into the portico and they're like, you guys are amazing. And Peter goes, why are you looking at us? This is crazy. This is what happens. This is what relationship and full possession acts like. Relationship and fully possessed by God doesn't go, well, yeah, of course I healed them. No. Relationship says, why do you look at us as though by our own strength and our own power we did this? Know this, that it's by the name and faith in his name, that name by which you crucified this man stands whole in front of you. Ooh, that's a little different. You killed the prince of life. You killed Jesus. That's why this man stands up. That's why he's healed. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. And they bring him in. Whoa. He's trying to bring this man's blood upon us. You're not going to talk in his name anymore. Oh, no, Peter. Peter's, uh, oh, we're not going out that way. Sorry. Oh, no. We cannot help but to talk about the things that we've both seen and heard. You judge in your eyes whether it's better to listen to you or to listen to God. Mm -mm. Not going out that way. They put him away. They're like, what are we going to do with these men? Everybody knows there's a noted miracle. What do we do? Gamaliel, Gamaliel, who is actually Saul's teacher. He's like, guys, listen. There was another man that said that he was from this, from God, and then all this went away. Gosh, guys, don't you know, it'll fizzle out. We should back off. Because if it is God, we can't stop it. And if it's not God, it'll just go away. Either way, we win. They're like, okay. They brought him in. They flogged him. They beat him. They still beat him. They flogged him. And the disciples, excited that they were worthy to suffer. (sighs) I got more stripes than you, dude. (laughs) They were excited. They got released, they went back, they're like, dudes, check this out. We got beat? (laughs) Look at my back, it's bleeding. So amazing. Whoa, worthy are you, Lord. Lord, look upon their threats. Look upon their threats. And grant to your servants, do what you did, but amplify it and bring on some more of that stuff. That's what they did. They said, Lord, we're getting persecuted. We're getting beaten for miracles. Give us some more anointing so we can do more miracles. We'll preach the name of your holy servant, Jesus, and stretch forth your hand to heal. And the house that they were in was shaken. But Christians, I can't believe you. Who do you think you are? I can't believe they rejected me. Done. I'm not doing that again. That made me feel bad. I'm kind of making fun, but it's, it's the same. Do you realize that every time you're quiet and not being able to talk about Jesus, you're denying him? You can say what you want. It'll all make sense when you stand before him. I'm hoping to make sense of it way earlier than that. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Kind (laughs) of. I love Jesus, buddy. I'm not going to answer. You're not going to be there to be my attorney when I stand before him. (laughs) You know, you have husbands and wives that are together and and the husband maybe not be on page, the wife is on page, or the wife is on page. The, either way, one of them's not where the other one should be. And they think that when they stand before the Lord that the, maybe the wife is gonna put in a good word for them. Sorry, your wife's not gonna be there with you. Uh-uh, when you stand before the Lord, it isn't gonna be husband and wife standing together. <laughs> Every one of us are gonna stand before him and answer for our life. And your God-fearing wife won't be there. Nope, you better pray that you fear God when you get there. Oh, that 
It's no joke, man, that's for real. We all have this ambition. All of us are gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're gonna all answer for the deeds done in our body. All of us. It's either gonna be the most amazing day ever or the scariest day you can't even imagine. And I will not live in fear of that day. I will fear him until I stand before him on that day so that I'll have nothing to fear because he's seen everything all along the way and he's proud of me. And I'm gonna live my life that way and I'm gonna go after it like never before. I'm done. I'm done living anything less than full on man. I'm done. Can I get the worship team to come up here? Sorry, guys, I've had you here forever. <laughs> if I have to do this alone, I will. Because I'm not alone, because Jesus is with me. He's with me. But I'm going to go after this with everything. I'm going to go after purity and power. We can't have one without the other. We can't have purity without power or we'll be religious. And we can't have power without purity or we'll be flaky Christians. We need to have it both. Purity and power. And we need to live our lives full on. If you're here and you know that you're not living this way, and there is conviction inside of your heart right now that's saying, I am done living this way and I am gonna go hard after this. I want you up here. This is the last Sunday night of the year. The last Sunday night of the year. There'll be no more Sunday night services in 2020. There'll be no more services in 2020, Sunday nights. This is the last encounter service. I would love to drift into the new year in high speed. I would love to get into the new year and be stomping hell already. I want a church that is chomping at the bit because the race doors are about to open, buddy. to where you cannot wait for those doors to open. You got a bit in your mouth and you're ready to roll. That's what I'm talking about. That's what God is looking for. God's looking for soldiers, man. He's not looking for people that are half-hearted in this thing. This is not, the devil is going full steam. You can't afford to go half-hearted. Jesus didn't say, just invite me into your life. Jesus didn't say, invite me into your heart. Jesus said, fully. You know when it talks about the grieving of the Holy, of the grieving of the Holy Ghost and the quenching? In the quenching, it says, may the God of peace sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body. That's a complete sanctification. That means that God wants to take your body and sanctify it. Your temple and sanctify, why? Because you are a temple that houses the Holy Ghost and you shouldn't be sharing your temple with stuff that, you sh that you're sharing it with. No joke, man. We're gonna answer for the deeds done in the body. Your body is a vessel for the Lord, is a vessel for him to use, for him to flow through, for him to destroy hell through. He wants to use your body as a weapon, an instrument of righteousness. He wants you to be able to be in his hands, to use you and pour you out. He wants to be able to pour you out like a drink offering. 
He wants the very life that you live, not a little bit of it, not most of it. He wants all of it. He wants the things that you watch on TV. He wants the things that you, that you listen to. He wants the music that you listen to. He wants you to listen to sanctified stuff, stuff that's gonna set you apart. He doesn't want you watching trash and putting things in that he paid a price to get rid of. We always got to be trying to get our filter clean, our filter clean, our filter clean, our filter clean. Why? Because we keep throwing stupid stuff into it. Somewhere along the line, someone said, if you watch this, this movie, that it, it's, it, it's okay. But if you watch that movie, it's not okay. So we've chose to not be religious and we've said anything goes. I've heard people say, you can watch Harry Potter. You can do this, you can do that. Why would you do that? Why would you waste an hour and a half of your life to put in trash and call it okay? That's compromise, man. That's not okay. God's looking for warriors. Next year, we're gonna be launching something that's similar to Power and Love. It's gonna be called Warriors Arise. Warriors arise. It's gonna be a Friday night and an all day Saturday event. Our first one is gonna be with Dan Moeller in March, right here at the training center, right here at the church. It's gonna be amazing, but it's gonna be all about this right here. Fully consecrated, fully in, fully surrendered, fully abandoned, the gospel or nothing. It's time we let go of compromise. We let go of all that stuff. It says, let go of the sin that so easily ensnares us. Sin is crouching at your door. Shut it. Shut it. Because when you shut it in the fear of the Lord, Jesus is on the inside with you. The Holy Spirit, we just say yes to you. We say yes to your presence, God. We say yes to your presence, God. We say yes. We turn our back on everything else. We turn our back on everything else and we say yes to your presence. We say no to the world. No to the world. No to the world. 